Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Monday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Monday, the 25th of February, 2019. Okay, viewers, listeners, we appreciate you watching the show. Uh, when you get a chance, please click like. Please share the episode. If you want, like everybody else, go to the comments section on YouTube and comment away. We really appreciate that. We read all the comments. If you are a Twitter person, please tweet and retweet the show and just get the word out that there's an Anglican Unscripted who has just uh, right now recording their 493rd episode. I'm having heart palpitations thinking about that. So I also need some ideas. What do you guys want to see for the 500th episode? So if you could put those in the comments, I'll try and do it. Or, you know, the, the, if you have some good ideas, we'll, George, Gavin, and I will talk about it and uh, try to put together our 500th show coming up. Um, we got a lot to talk about. What we're going to talk about is very difficult. It's the corruption of the church. It's the spiritual nature of this, not just the, uh, what you see happening not just the news. Uh, the news out there is atrocious, but this is, uh, this is coming to a climax. We're going to talk about the Roman Catholic Church. We'll certainly talk about the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church. Um, and this is going to be a hard conversation for you to listen to um, because we talk about spiritual things, not just news things. Um, before we get started, though, um, how are you guys doing? Before we get to the tough stuff, Gavin, you have a good week? Oh, it's really lovely. It's, it's like a spring day in May here. Um, the birds are singing. The sunshine is warm. Uh, it's very odd that it's England in February. Uh, I, I, um, it, it does make you worry about the seasons a little bit. I've never been hugely impressed by global warming as an argument, um, but I can certainly sense that the seasons aren't behaving as they should do. However, there's a, it, today it's beautiful here. That's good. George, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, life is going on its merry way. Mm -hmm. There's no better There's no better way to live than as a parish priest, because it's a lot of fun. Well, that's good to hear. Up here, we're having gale force winds. You're going to hear howling on my microphone. I can't help it. Um, I live on the shore, and it, it's apparently gale season. Um, but let's get started here. Uh, I'm going to read a verse from Romans. Therefore God gave them up in their lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the uh, creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Uh, Christianity, by design, is simple and complex. Avoiding it is destruction. Walking away from it is destruction. Teaching it inc uh, incorrectly and uh, teaching a false gospel is destruction. And I think the church over the last 2,000 years has hit a climatic period where um, the game is almost over. And I want to talk about this. Gavin, you've been reading the book. Let's start with you. I was shocked when Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger, who is one of the most stable, um, reserved, Germanic uh, intellectuals that one could meet, uh, when he, he let slip that in his view the Catholic Church would be reduced to something very small, uh, a small faithful minority, rather along the lines that one imagined Jesus may have had in mind when he said, when I come back, will I find faith on earth? This is so counterintuitive in, in <clears throat> for those of us with a keen historical sense that it was it's not only hard to believe, but particularly hard to believe a pope should say it. No one knows quite why he resigned. But there's been a book published called In the Closet of the Vatican, Power, Homosexuality, Homosexuality and Hypocrisy by Frédéric Martel. Interesting he has the name Martel. Martel uh, <laughs> uh, Charles Martel. Well, exactly. <laughs> it makes you think of Charles Martel and the Battle of Tours, I think. Uh, so this is Fred Martel, Frédéric Martel. Now, now, Frédéric Martel is a gay activist, 
And he's really angry about the hypocrisy of homosexuals in the Catholic Church. He doesn't share all of our values, though he shares some of them. And for four years, he's written a book. He's gone inside the Vatican. Um, and he says a number of things. First of all, he places the number of homosexual clergy inside the Vatican at over 80%, which is a great shock. Uh, and then he talks, then he interviews them. And all the things we've been reading about that's been, that are seeping through the media cracks in terms of sexual abuse, he gives chapter and verse to uh, and people. And then he describes the most extraordinary culture. One had got little examples of it, as, as George said earlier on, um, in St. Stephen's house under, under um, Bishop, who became Archbishop Hope. Uh, they all called each other uh, feminine names. And so Frédéric Martel describes the way in the Vatican, when they speak French or German, uh, all the cardinals and the, uh, and the senior figures, they're all elle, they're all she. And uh, if elle est fière, as in, as in she is female proud rather than using the masculine forms. This feminization of people comes as a shock because it's so explicit and so extreme, I think, that, that, that such a culture should be overt inside the Vatican. Now, Martel makes a distinction between, uh, um, sorry, what Martel doesn't do, Damien Thompson, the English Roman Catholic critic, accuses him of this. He doesn't understand that in the Christian moral economy, there's a real difference between being homosexual and, and, and practicing sexual acts. Martel's not terribly interested in that. He's much more interested about hypocrisy. From our point of view, what he's doing is he's lifting the lid on the extent to which there has been the most, just, just the most extreme homosexualization of culture within the Catholic Church. He talks about the way for, for, for the last two or three generations, gay Italian men would simply enter the church as a place they could naturally be gay uh, and, 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 and dress up and have lace and, and adopt the feminization of, of persona that he describes uh, in a way that some of us might have kind of half suspected with 5% of our brain. And it now turns out to be 80% of the narrative. So it's a huge shock. Um, he's, he's very ambivalent about Francis. Um, and um, again, he gives us material by which we can try and understand it. But if you then see what's happening to the Catholic Church as, as the most dreadful form of corruption, the kind of corruption that, frankly, makes, makes Western Catholicism in 1510 look pretty tame compared to the reformation of morals that's required today. Um, if, you, if you see that happening under the covers in the Catholic Church, it, it then gives you a different flavor for what's happening in Episcopal circles. Because what you see is, is a, 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 a really unpleasant, uh, spiritually and morally debased distortion of human character, which whilst it's happening in secret in Catholicism, is happening in the open, in Episcopalianism. In other words, under the guise of human rights and inclusivity and progressiveness and being kind, we're bringing this stuff in in the open that, that they are practicing in secret. But it's the same stuff, and spiritually, it's very dark stuff. George, I've heard rumors over and over again for years that this happens in America as well. This isn't something of European Roman Catholicism. Uh, this is something here in America as well. Uh, you gave a story in, in the pre-show. Uh, why don't you tell us? Well, uh, two points I would make is that uh, it's not just confined to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had a long chat with uh, a former Roman Catholic. The man was a very prominent attorney, was a uh, counsel for a congressional committee in the 70s that was quite prominent. In other words, this is not some hayseed or somebody quick to see uh, uh, ghosts under the bed. Uh, he was asked to represent a Catholic priest who was dismissed, was suspended by his bishop and kicked out of his rectory. Well, what the priest had done was that on behalf of 29 other diocesan priests, he went to his bishop and reported the vicar general was molesting altar boys. The bishop responded by basically uh, expelling him to outer darkness. Well, uh, about in the passage of time, uh, the vicar general was arrested uh, by the police for abuse, and the bishop gave a deposition where he said, I had no knowledge whatsoever that this was going on. I'm shocked, shocked. 
And of course, this was an outright fabrication because he had been warned by his own clergy, but he chose to protect mm. his friend. And the upshot was that the priest who was suspended, his lawyer negotiated were a briefcase with almost, I think what the number was $86,000 in cash was given to him. And he was allowed to write a rec his own recommendation the bishop had signed to allow him to move to another diocese. And this so, this, this was uh, the sort of lawyer who would be sit in the front row of the annual red mass at our cathedral in Orlando. Uh, he couldn't take it and he left and he, he uh, entered the Anglican world. Uh, this, is a this is a current story uh, by current people. Um, and the other thing I would mention is it's not confined to the, uh, my, uh, Paul Moore was one of the great bishops of the Episcopal Church in the 20th century. I would describe him as the bishop out of central casting. Tall, leonine, handsome, silver-haired, silver-tongued, scion of a very wealthy family, a graduate of Princeton, enlisted in 40 after Pearl Harbor, earned the Navy Cross at Guadalcanal, uh, badly wounded, when after the war got married, had five children, entered the priest and was a slum priest, a slum priest, a good old fashioned slum priest working with the poorest of the poor. Then he became assistant Bishop of Washington, then Bishop of New York. The man, he was on cover of Time and Life magazine. Mm -hmm. He was the image of everybody's grandmother wants a bishop to be. Well, meanwhile, he was sleeping with uh, seminarians, male and female, molesting them. And this only came out, this came out, was publicly acknowledged beginning of this winter when the Bishop of New York Andrew Dietschy put out a letter saying, if anybody's been molested by Bishop Moore, please let me know so that we can help you. Uh, this, Paul Moore is as big and consequential a bishop as can be. And there are other Episcopal bishops, not as famous, not as notable, who, who may not have had as a flamboyant a career, but who have gone down this path as there are Episcopal priests and lay leaders. This, now, is this, I'm very leery of going down this road because it's so easy to pick up a stone and say, all Catholics are closet homosexuals or all this or that, or all homosexuals are perverts. And I'm not trying to say that in the slightest and I reject those characterizations. As Gavin says, you know, Damien Thompson, an English Catholic writer who happens to be gay, makes the distinction between orientation and action and but what we're seeing here is an upsurge of the demonic in the life of the church in ways that since the times of saint peter damien in the 11th century have not been that bad well it's yeah it, at one point it's sexual corruption at another point it's financial corruption and you know the corruption is on so many different levels i want to read from you a threat heard around the world last week um if Archbishop Welby's decision stands, I think that the day is coming when we will need to take a hard look at where and how we invest the resources of the Episcopal Church across the Anglican Communion. Um, that was given by Clark Jennings, gay Clark Jennings, uh, who's what? What's her title again, George? President, President of the House, House of Deputies. Deputies. The Episcopal Church. And that's the uh, financial corruption. That's, uh, we have the money to help the Anglican Communion grow. We got Trinity Wall Street. If Justin Welby doesn't hold line with uh, the coming gay culture in the Episcopal Church, we're not gonna help. There's no way you're gonna buy a big blue tent. Um, this is corruption, George. Yes, but that sort of corruption, I think is, uh, it's the second, it, it's one of the secondary attributes of the greater corruption, which is the moral and spiritual corruption that has taken hold of the church. Where power, uh, Stephen Knoll had a wonderful paper that we published in Anglican Inc. on follow the power. And this is a corruption of power, of people aggrandizing to themselves uh, authority and power and dominion over others. Kevin, at the end of the day, money is nice, it's important. I wish I had some more of it myself. But the real battle is spiritual. And it's the end. The Episcopal Church has not invested anything spiritually in the Anglican Communion for 30 years. Uh, so I'm not particularly, I don't see much of a consequence of anything. You know, 
bureaucrats have a way, however much money New York sends to London, mm -hmm. it's sucked up into bureauc bureaucratic make work jobs. It really doesn't matter. The issue for me is the spiritual battles that are being fought. And frankly, we're being we're on our back feet right now. We're being pushed really hard. I, I remember being uh, really astonished uh, reading <clears throat> actually in the, in the writings of a contemporary Greek Orthodox, uh, I hate to use the word mystic, Let, let's say somebody, somebody who had um, a proven track record on spiritual judgment. Uh, <clears throat> drawing the dots between the power of evil in our society and the scale of abortion. So in the Old Testament, we're used to the idea that child sacrifice was designed to appease the, the darker gods. Uh, and many of us think, well, that is so barbaric and so appalling and, and something that would, 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 we're so far past in terms of human progress. And then to discover that, of course, the way in which we practice abortion with the industrialized numbers of children we sacrifice. And what do we sacrifice them to? Well, um, it, we go back to what Kevin was reading at the beginning. Uh, those who exchange the worship of God for the worship of of, of the of the creature. There's a it, it's it's to do with lifestyle, comfort, convenience, um, a way of, of cleaning up after being careless in terms of contraception. But the reality is that, that hundreds of millions of our babies have been sacrificed to our lifestyle. Now, in the realm of of spiritual economics. One of the things that does is transfer capital away from the side of good to the side of evil. And so the people who write about this with a particular spiritual acumen say that we are in danger in our culture of, of giving fuel to evil that then strengthens it and allowing it to overcome the good. And one of the things we've seen in this last century is a muscular level of evil wreaking havoc in terms of terrifying totalitarian regimes, just killing people, uh, wreaking havoc in terms of, of moral degeneracy. Um, of course, there's been moral degeneracy throughout the ages, but, but to discover the levels of child abuse in our society, and, the, and, and in particular, I think I'd like to go on to say, to move it to a new area, in England at the moment, there's a parliament today are debating uh, a bill which will uh, which will allow because we face the, a law that will make sex education compulsory sex education that has been driven by stonewall and the lgbt activists and so there's been an online petition from parents saying they'd like to withdraw their children from it and what is what is behind all this and the answer is the over sexualization of our children so with this sex education program that Stonewall and the LGBT community are implementing at the heart of our education system, young children then get uh, lectured and made aware of a level of sexualization that would never, ever have happened outside explicit pornography in any culture before. So there's an attempt to try and stop it here. Who knows if it'll be successful? But there's a fear that the muscularity of evil is is leveraging against the good in a rather frightening way. Well, General Synod is meeting right now in, or just met, uh, in England. I'm sure they had something to say about this, right? Well, of course, they're completely silent on it because, mm -hmm. uh, because, um, and this is this is the difficulty. This is why some of us are so upset with, with Justin Welby in the House of Bishops, because there's a degree of virtue signaling in terms of, I suppose, you know, the best kind of, of, of social public conscience, but actually in terms of an awareness of where real corruption, real evil, real perversion, the real danger to people's souls lie, there's, there's a complete unawareness. I, I was asked to go on television to talk about Justin, not television, radio in London. Sorry, I, I misspoke. Um, this is the only TV you need. Come on. <laughs> uh, the, I think it was yesterday. Yes, it was Sunday yesterday. To, to talk about Justin Welby's calling for five days of prayer for Brexit. Um, and, and let's leave aside the, the uh, future um, diagnostics of economics because Brexit could work out to be very good or very bad. Who knows? My concern was, I, I said on the radio, look, it's the Archbishop's job to be helping people get to heaven. That's his primary brief. 
Uh, and although he may or may not be interested in economics, um, the danger is even the economists aren't very good at it, but he could be good at salvation. And my beef with the archbishop is he's not talking about salvation in the public sphere. Well, to this to, to the presenter and a whole lot of people who followed was gobbledygook because they said, well, we understand a nice man's preoccupation with the poor, uh, to stopping the poor getting poorer. And I began by saying that when I was a priest in the East End, not exactly a slum priest, um, but, but, but my church warden, who was 70, had no shoes as a child. We had a big argument about whether or not we should have alcohol at the, at the Eucharist because his father was an alcoholic, drank all the money away, and he spent the winters barefoot in the East End of London. That was poverty. Um, today, um, an unmarried woman with two children gets £23,000 from the state a year to, to, to keep her fed, housed and warm. It's not a great deal, but it's quite a lot. Um, the, the idea that we suffer poverty in the fifth biggest economy in the country of a kind that threatens life and limb and that, to, to make it the, the most important thing. Um, in Venezuela at the moment, I can imagine it being really important, making sure children are fed. But people have a hard time in London. But surely an archbishop should be talking about salvation before he talks about relative material convenience. And that's where we are in the Church of England. But the uh, prayers matter. And I saw some prayers written by the Archbishop of York, uh, John Santamu. And I'm going to be petty, but... Uh, pray, you know, pray for the, our parliamentary democracy. Pray for, in other words, he had some very specific politically uh, direct prayers. And my response was, yes, Jesus came to save, gave to save British parliamentary democracy. Uh, the human soul, that's another issue that we're not really going to get involved in, but we can pray for Brexit. We can pray for this group of uh, Labour MPs who have uh, gone off to oppose. The, and I'm being silly, but the point that I'm trying to make is John Santamu is not a man of any consequence spiritually. He has a high office. He has a soapbox in the House of Lords and had his office as the Archbishop of York. But he is not moving a single person towards uh, the beatific vision in his public prayers and utterances. Now, what's really upsetting was I knew Johnson Tamu in the 1980s in, in, in South London. Uh, I, he did a couple of weekends in the parish I was involved with. And do you know, George, spiritually, he was, he was good. There was a level of real potency there. The horror is that to the, to the observer on the sidelines, as I am, a man who really did know what he was talking about spiritually has become what appears to be a bad-tempered, ecclesiastical, politicized bureaucrat, which actually I'm afraid, well, I'm really sorry to speak poorly of people, but, but both Welby and Sentamu appear to have fallen in that mold. And I'm sure they knew better at one stage. Uh, how is it that they have succumbed to a secularization of spirit, which is what the Church of England now represents? Yeah. This is such an important issue, uh, I guess, for, from, our, from my perspective, from our perspective. Uh, people will write in comments that you're just too darn mean to Welby, and Tamu. You're attacking the man. And I take that very seriously because if I'm attacking the person, there's no hope for my being able to see or pray for that person to know the good or the true. And... There's got to be a way, and I haven't quite found how to do it, to separate the person, because all people are fallen, all are broken. I'm a firm believer in original sin and the issue. And Gavin, you are exactly right about what you've said about St. Tom and Welby. In fact, I've said that I've said similar things in a much more coarse way many times. Well, what do we do? Well, how do we help people? I well, I, I think. I think over time, and it's helping something that we can even do. I think should. over time, certain clergy people find it much easier to preach the social gospel over the Christian gospel, and the social gospel is accepted by society. There's no terseness. There's no confrontation. You're not going to get arrested on the streets of London for preaching the social gospel. 
this was exactly the, the so much the point, Kevin, because on this radio program, person after person weighed in saying, I understand why a good person would be worried about poverty. What was that man Ashenden going on about when he was talking about heaven? What's that got to do with anything realistic? And a few people wrote to me on Facebook and elsewhere saying, thank you so much for talking about heaven because we think that's what the project's all about. But I, 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 in answer to George, I think, I think the, the, the one difference is when people say mea culpa, pray for me, I may be getting things wrong. Pray for me. I, I uh, uh, a, a sense, a sense of penitence and humility. Uh, th then I think one can trust that there's something really authentically going on. I think the difficulty I have with the senior Anglican hierarchs is this sense of fragile penitence appears to me to be missing entirely. There is instead a kind of what appears to me to be a bad-tempered bossiness. Now, the only difference between me and, and, and the most awful sinner is, if there is a difference, I, I, I get on my knees and I try and say sorry as much as I can for screwing up and for missing the point. Um, I, I think that, that is the only thing, perhaps, that saves us from going off spiritually. And in the end, also being willing to talk about the metaphysics uh, just as Kevin was saying, the metaphysics of the kingdom, because the Gospels are, are full of Jesus worrying about heaven and hell on behalf of his sheep. He doesn't worry about, he doesn't even worry about Jewish nationalism. He doesn't even worry about Jerusalem, which was the culmination of the, of the whole thousand years project. And he kind of ought to have worried about it, but, but he accepts that it will not a stone will be left upon stone. He's very, very worried about people going to heaven or hell. And I don't see how you can do Christianity without sharing that worry as a priority. All right. Well, you spent 25 minutes describing the problem. I think we're behooving to offer a solution. George? Well, well this is not a solution, but an observation. Okay. Uh, this as we're filming today, we don't know the outcome of the Methodist General Council in St. Louis, Missouri. The Methodists are meeting and they are either going to split or they're going to muddle on with some sort of, uh, they're going to split, uh, well, either officially or unofficially. Yeah, and, what, hold on for our non-Methodist viewers. Uh, what are they going to split over? These issues, homosexuality. Yeah. Reading some of the reports from that conference, uh, printed by our friend Jeff Walton of the IRID, you can the vehemence and the nastiness of some of the gay activists, um, basically saying we want to kick you people out and we want to keep your buildings and this and that. I mean, I've seen it all before in the Episcopal Church, but the I should I, I'll use the phrase the box is being shaken. All the all the certainties are up in the air. We're seeing the box has been shaken in the Methodist. The box is being shaken in the Anglican world. The box has been shaken, is being shaken very roughly in the Catholic world. Maybe, maybe it is God's will that we will see a reunion of Christendom of Catholics, Methodists, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Baptists, and Pentecostals, even Catholics in our lifetimes. Uh, I I think that is that's wonderfully hopeful. I go on thinking that so much of the geography, this, the kind of psycho or pneumatic geography of our mind, is badly locked in to the to Reformation uh, issues. Uh, but 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 actually, there is a unity of, of Holy Spiritness, a, a unity of the clarity of vision of the Kingdom of Heaven, which draws people together very powerfully. If you like a kind of hung, blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, the poor in spirit recognize each other and I think that may very well be. Kevin asks for a solution. Uh, I think it's a terrifying solution. I think Benedict may be, Benedict the 16th may be right. The Benedict option with Rod Dreher may be right. What we may find ourselves is groups of the poor in spirit gathering together hungering for holiness in a kind of catacomb life uh, because the rest is likely to get burnt off and although that sounds there won't be many of us left. Um, at least it will be authentic. And this isn't a kind of uh, recidivist Puritanism uh, like the Plymouth Brethren. This is this is actually the what what happens when the juggernaut 
of of satanic secularism crushes a church that has no defenses uh, get, get, I, i'm going to be kevin you should jump in at this point because you're our tech guy but the, one of the reasons why the reformation worked was the printing press we had a new technology that allowed people to gain knowledge and communicate and and the old ways of doing things where only the priest and the educated spoke latin were over well uh, one of the things that I've, I've, I've where i'm going with this is now we're in a new age gavin Kevin has a, kevin's on new caxton <laughs> well, yeah, gavin has an internet ministry and 10 years ago i think most people would go oh, that's a silly idea the internet's not real it's just for selling things but the way we relate to people uh in the background, you hear this little machine beeping because my daughter is texting me 10, 10, you know. She doesn't write letters. She doesn't telephone. She texts. Technology, I think, though it's a tool for destruction in, the, in so many ways, this may be one of the ways that we bring together these disparate communities seeking holiness. We We're are not exactly bound. Anymore. Let's be very clear. The purpose of Anglican TV and on script is obviously to give the news, but we've discovered over time we're, the, we're a voice of hope. Uh, we're a voice of encouragement. We're actually transparent. Uh, as far as I can tell, and I certainly speak of uh, George and Gavin, we're true believers. And um, we are completely disheartened by the corruption in the church and the corruption in our society. And just the other day, we had a preacher on the streets of London, arrested. And he was arrested because society has changed. Society used to give Christianity, at least the last 50 years, the benefit of the doubt. Now that's been given on to Islam. They get the benefit of the doubt. And it's so hard to watch this play out in uh, the media, play out in our society, where slowly and slowly and securely Christianity is being crushed by the people we want to serve, by the nations we want to serve, by the nations and people we pray for. And in this difficulty, is the Benedict option the way to go? Is just trying to find a place on the internet where we can have our ministries and, and broadcast them out to uh, uh, Christians the way to go? I don't know, but I know in, there's a day coming when this program will not be allowed to exist on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a day coming, and we just saw last week, where Christians are blocked on Facebook for posts they put or pictures they put up. And there's a censorship that's going to happen on the internet. And we're going to have to hope that we're allowed to have a corner here as you know, kind of a, a Benedictine colony on the internet that's safe. Uh, it's, it's just as bad as society, and the atheists are all over uh, the internet. The, this is where they rule. This is where they tweet. Um, this is where the, you know, they get their four-year degree and they go work for Google. And uh, they don't care what we think. And they know it's easier to block us than to listen to us. Well, and, it, the, the blocking of the internet is the equivalent of the burning of books, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, when I, when I, I, my last few years have, have been very eccentric, and I lie in bed sometimes praying and, and saying to God, I'm afraid of looking ridiculous. Um, what I've done appears to me to be so eccentric and so ridiculous. What, what if I really am a complete idiot? I, should I not have stayed within the institution? Could I not have done more good there? And yet the extraordinary thing, not to blow my own trumpet, but to say that, that I've been so moved by people who have written to me because they've been completely isolated. A, a, a woman in the middle of Idaho who cannot find anywhere she can drive to where she where where the gospel is preached with any level of biblical uh faithfulness uh, pe people who are are very lonely and very deprived and so just as george was describing the internet has become a place a new catacomb where people can find spiritual succor it, never in any parish church have I, I had have i had between 50 and 200 people saying the daily office with me which is what happens at the moment my congregations have never really been bigger than a hundred, but but astonishingly, YouTube allows many more people to 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 to, to pick up a sermon. So, uh, what is the hope? 
actually the hope is what we're doing now it's telling the truth in the public sphere in a way that resonates with people's experience of god uh, and and as as jesus showed us telling the truth is an important way of allowing god into a situation and for the moment we're allowed to use the internet to do it we should maximize it as much as we can while we're allowed to if i may jump in and follow up on gavin's point uh, I had mentioned I, I was wondering why I had been blackballed by a conservative Episcopal group. Mm, mm. And uh, Aviva wrote to me and say, George, you stupid idiot. Uh, of course you're going to be blackballed. Uh, how many people read the bishop's monthly newsletter? How mm. many people pay attention to the bishop? How many people, the platform that you have, is so tremendous compared to the platform of any other member of the clergy uh, in your locale, that of course the bishops and the leaders were going to be jealous. And we, if you look, I should have put this without seeming like a jerk, you look at the videos put out by the National Church, the messages, and the, and, or by the Arch Lambeth Palace, and we do better than they do. We have higher ratings. Now, no, and, and they had 124 on their last video with views. Let me double check. You keep talking. Well, the, the point is, you know, the market, and I know that's a terrible thing for some people to hear, the market is basically uh, quite good to us because we have something people want to listen to and hear. And then for most of the institutions, they do this sort of thing because they think they should, and nobody bothers watching. Mm -hmm. For um, the amount of money that Church House and the, Episco and the Episcopal News Service puts into their technology and into the videotaping um, and into hiring videographers, I am completely shocked by the lower low viewership they get. It's, it's and it's not that it's poor quality. I, I mean, they do. I mean, they hire good people. They yeah. have good writers. It, the the lighting is wonderful. The camera angle is perfect. The microphone is placed right there where it belongs, but there's no content. And the 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 future, you know, Gavin, I think it's unheard of for anybody anywhere, maybe at the Cathedral in Lagos, to have two hundred people watching, participating in morning prayer. Mm. It's most That's, unusual. It, it's it it's not normal. In, this, in, in our world yet, the world is changing so very rapidly. And so I don't want people, to, I, I guess I'm always concerned that people will despair. They hear us talking about all these difficulties. They hear us discussing the corruption, the venality, the cruelty. And, they, and there's a fear, I have a fear that they'll just wipe, wipe their hands and just walk away. Don't do that. There are op options for you out there. Well, there's, there's hope the, there in what... technologies to reach them. Well, there's technology, but there's also something else I want to offer, and that's prayer and fasting. You know, you can be a fasting participant. Doesn't look like something we're very. Uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> fasting? Well, no, I do. I fast uh, uh, breakfast every day, but you know, the reality is, you can be a participant in this, not just a viewer, not just a reader, not just a listener, not just a person who uh, goes through uh, Facebook uh, ten times a day in the news feed. You are an active participant in the kingdom. And one of the ways we can uh, participate is to pray for our society. And maybe once a month, we'll just have an unscripted uh, day of fasting where we pray for the things that we talk about, where, you know, we are true believers, uh, George, Gavin, and I, in what we talk about, in uh, the, the belief in the kingdom, and the belief in what's happening when I read from mm -hmm. Romans 124. You know, that God is giving over this world to its its desires, its sexual mortality, and you're just watching it. It's true and flawed. True and flawed believers. <laughs> we must have. Oh, yeah. Oh, hold on. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing perfect about Kevin, but I affirm when I sin that I need to repent of it. And the affirmation is not that the sin is good and that I'd have to live with it. The affirmation is that uh, it was wrong and I need to get on my knees, which I do daily. And I repent of my sin and uh, uh, pray that the mercy of God, I would never do it again. So that's that's how it works. Guys, we have done this now for 
Uh, 40 minutes. We've certainly uh, taken uh, I probably time out of George's next meeting. We apologize for that. Uh, we should sign off here. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashend, and you've been listening to Anglican Unscripted episode 493.